Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis' 70s, and today we're talking about July gardening, <clears throat> just general tips. Um, if you are watching today uh, during the live stream, we have attached a handout at the top of this video right under the description that is just um, like what to do in the garden in July. And if, as I mentioned, you're watching right now, if you've got a question, um, please put it into the comment section and I'm gonna do my best to answer them during the video um, or after the video if your question comes in afterwards. July typically is, um, you know, like a mid-summer mid month in the garden. Clearly what I have with me right now is a representation of some of the plants that are in peak bloom. Um, we've got, of course, um, roses represented as well as hydrangeas represented because those are two of our kind of staple plants in the landscape for long blooming kind of high performance plants. Um, hydrangeas, best in shade or filtered sun. Um, maybe morning sun, but afternoon shade. They're not very heat or drought tolerant. And then in the full sun, at least six hours of sun or more would be our roses. And both of these plants, hydrangeas and roses, typically start blooming in um, June in our area and will flower uh, sporadically, but continue to flower through often September and sometimes even later, depending on how the fall um, plays out. So uh, <clears throat> our standard mop head style hydrangea, what I have here, and I'm gonna show you today how to deadhead or do um, just like mid-season pruning on your hydrangea. And then we also have, uh, this is hydrangea vanilla strawberry over here. And vanilla strawberry is one of the panicle style hydrangeas. So with that cone-shaped bloom, um, pointy cone-shaped bloom, usually in whites or ivory, that will uh, age to a pink color as the evening uh, temperatures cool, so towards fall usually. The um, kind of, you know, garden, the rhythm of the garden in uh, midsummer is that clearly a lot of early spring plants have gone out of bloom. Um, things that were uh, flowering in April and May are now either creating seed heads or need to be cut back. And a lot of those plants, if they've been cut back at this point in the season, will regrow for the next, you know, six, eight weeks of good weather. And often we'll see perennials, for example, do another bloom cycle in early fall or mid fall. Delphiniums are a great example of a perennial that is just finishing flowering now cut them all the way down to take the flower stalk and everything all the way down to the base of the plant and it's going to grow new leaves <clears throat> that are fresh and kind of healthy looking and then create a flower bud that will give you that um, probably early September, late August, early September bloom. So six weeks or so from now. It's also um, guaranteed by, you know, mid-July, here we are mid-July, it's pretty guaranteed that we've had some hot days. And um, although in the Pacific Northwest and the Portland area where we are, we had a very wet, cool spring. So we had a late start to our summer season. And once the sun, you know, really came out and got warm, it got hot pretty quickly. And so the, the uh, extremes in temperature have given us a Sorry, having some issues there. that's okay i'm i see my picture is wobbling we just had an earthquake um <laughs> some of your plants may have struggled in you know the 98 degree weather that we had recently we've had some you know kind of short um intense peaks of heat and that can be a challenge to keep things watered to not overwater when we kind of panic and water things, you know, extra just to make sure that they're cool and hydrated. <clears throat> and so possibly some of your plants may be looking a little rough 
at this point in the season. And just in time for, you know, parties and barbecues and um, outdoor entertaining time, you really want your hanging baskets and your flower pots and things to look um, cheery and healthy and at their peak. So now, of course, is a time to um, continue to fertilize. If you haven't fertilized lately, um, everything from hanging baskets. Let's see, where's my fertilizer? Um, hanging baskets. Oh my gosh, I can't see what I've got up front. Your planted containers, the vegetables in, in your raised beds or in the garden, um, even newly planted landscape plants would benefit from a gentle feeding. And we're not talking about going and giving them, um, you know, Red Bull or rocket fuel or anything like that. We want to give them something that's kind of slow, um, gentle and organic, ideally to avoid accidentally burning the roots or, or creating too much rapid growth on a plant that may be a little sensitive time of year it might sunburn. So something organic, even um, your granular fertilizers that you may have in the garden shed right now, go out and look in your garden shed. If you bought bags of fertilizer in spring and use them at planting time and you haven't gotten back into the shed to get those bags out again, now is a great time to see what you've got left and use up any open bags of fertilizer that you may have. Um, directions and um, you know if you've got a roadie or a, an acid loving fertilizer focus on uh, dogwoods rhododendrons azaleas camellias even hydrangeas if you want them to be blue you can give them the acid fertilizer uh, if you have veggie food go ahead and feed your vegetable garden with the uh, tomato vegetable herb fertilizer and if that's all you've got give it to your perennials and your flowers as well uh, vegetable food is formulated for bloom, uh, so that same food is going to help to stimulate flowers in your flower beds. If you've got um, an all-purpose fertilizer, well then there you have it. It's an all-purpose. Everybody can eat it. If you have bags of Portland Rose Society fertilizer and you haven't fed your roses recently, they should be fed about every six, me six weeks or so. Um, so again, now could be a good time to feed those roses to get them to uh, go through another round of flowering now that they've kind of put on their first um, flush of blooms. Using up the fertilizer is not only a good idea just to clean out your shed and keep your plants healthy and blooming, but often uh, the organic and probiotic blends of fertilizers, if you look closely on the bag, somewhere on there you will see an expiration date and you want to be sure that you use up those fertilizers before they expire. It's not as if suddenly the, the nutrients in the fertilizer are going to go bad or um, wear out necessarily. The expiration date is referring to the lifespan of the probiotics that are put into most of those foods. So our um, dry blends, the granular blends of um, organic fertilizer that we carry have a, um, a plethora of microbes, beneficial fungi and bacteria that are put into that food and they will die after about, uh, I believe it's 18 months or something like that. So there is a shelf life on that food. You wanna use it up and then buy new fertilizer the next time you're ready to um, apply it in your garden. <coughs> Liquid fertilizer, as I mentioned, Something like our organic high bloom, this is 131. This is a concentrated bottle of liquid fertilizer. You dilute it by adding it to a bucket or a watering can or a container of your own, and then feed that diluted solution by pouring it straight into um, the ground around plants or into the container around your plants or hanging baskets or whatever. Granular fertilizer is more powdery or dusty and is going to be done by measuring scoops and applied around the base of the plant and then watered in to activate it or to kind of turn that granular into a liquid. Regular deadheading is also going to help to keep plants blooming and stimulate um, the kind of uh, continual cycle of blooms. So here, for example, on, let's make a little room. 
on a simple pot of geraniums. We have a lovely pot of zonal geraniums, probably one of the most common um, annuals that's grown like coast to coast. Most everybody has a geranium. Um, they do best in at least a half day of sun. But we see on a geranium, it's gonna continue to bloom through the summer. We've got fresh flowers out, buds that have not yet opened yet. Oops, I just broke that bud off. Um, be careful, some of them are delicate. Um, but so we have flower buds fresh, flower buds that are starting to kind of um, look a little worn out. And then here's a bloom that is completely done and has lost all of its color. Not a deadhead, a geranium. I don't need to get any kind of pruning supplies or scissors or anything like that because the stem of the geranium, if you bend it away from uh, the, if you bend the bloom stem away from the main growth stalk of the geranium, at the right angle, it just snaps right off really easily and cleanly. And so by showing you here, This little spent stalk, we can see where it's attached to the main part of the plant. And if I just reach down, I'll show you closer in a minute, but if I just reach down and bend it away from, I get that whole stem and the blooms that were left up at the very top. So we would not deadhead a geranium by pulling it off like so. That would leave this whole stem with nothing that will ever regrow from it. So you will just have these long, uh, slowly, they'll kind of turn brown and dry up. So that's not gonna be very attractive. So we want to, again, go in. We'll take this one now because it's more than 50% uh, spent. So we've got another flower bud that's sitting right here, ready to bloom. We'll take this one off by just reaching in far as we can go right where it's attached to the plant snap it off and there again you see that whole beautiful stem and the spent geranium <clears throat> so one more maybe oh let's do that one now if we look at this flower <clears throat> if we look closely at this flower bud we can actually start to see a seed forming. So you see this pointy part up at the top. So that's a seed, a geranium seed starting to form. And we wanna to try to get the flowers before they start to form seeds. So if you see that uh, on your flowers, it's not like a new flower growing, it's just a seed coming and we wanna take that away. So it's a good sign that of course, um, it was time to remove this flower stem. <clears throat> and we've got lots more blooms that are forming and buds that are um, going to be next on this flower, on this geranium. So we've got um, months more of blooms to go on it. While you're deadheading your geranium or any of your hanging baskets or flower pots or flowers, <clears throat> it gives you a chance to kind of uh, take a closer look at them at the same time. If, for example, you have a pot of zonal geraniums and maybe they've been fed, they're in full sun, you've watered them faithfully, but they're not blooming. If that is the case, and here we are in July, chances are very strong that your geranium has a pest that's known as a budworm. And a budworm is going to go it's a good thing I accidentally snapped this flower bud off because now I can show you what a budworm is going to do. <clears throat> so a budworm on this tiny little geranium flower bud, there's lots of individual flowers that are all packed tightly in this bud. And a geranium budworm, which is basically a caterpillar, starts off small enough that it can eat a hole into the side of this little flower bud. And now once it's hiding inside the bud, it munches away at all of the flower petals inside the developing flower bud. And so you may see buds form on your plant, but they never mature 
to an open flower. And upon close inspection of those buds, you may see pin-sized holes in the sides of the flowers, which would be a good indication that you've got something inside of them. You may also notice on the same plant, by looking at the whole plant, in addition to no buds or no flowers open, if you look closely further down into the foliage, you're not likely to actually see the caterpillar. They're really sneaky. They're hard to see in the first place. They hide and because of what they're eating and the way that their digestive system sits like right underneath their skin, they turn the color of what they've been eating. So if they're eating this violet colored petunia, they're gonna have a pinkish violet color, the whole caterpillar, which makes it really hard to spot. If they're eating the leaves, they're gonna turn pretty much the color of the leaves. Again, very clever disguise. However, their poop is also going to be the color of kind of what they've been eating and their poop <clears throat> is what you really are going to be able to see. So in addition to those pin sized holes, the lack of flowers developing, you look further down on the plant and you may see little piles of like bits of dirt at first it looks like dirt or maybe kind of like some people say pepper. It doesn't look like pepper. It's bigger than pepper. It's, um, if you look really closely, they are cylindrical because they've been squeezed out of a caterpillar's intestine and that's the shape of a caterpillar. So when you look at the foliage and you see little piles of something, debris, sort of resembles the coloration of your petals, you can add all of those signs together to tell you that you've got a petunia or geranium budworm infestation and the product that you would want to use to apply and uh, both kill and repel those pests would be a caterpillar killer. So either that is Bacillus thuringiensis or a BT solution or Captain Jack's dead bug, which is spinosad. Um, and spinosad is, um, uh, just a useful tool for caterpillars, borers, bagworms, also works on leaf miners um, and quite a few other common pests. We carry the Captain Jack's dead bug in um, this really nice application which is screws onto your hose. You don't need to mix it up um, but you don't need to like sit there and spray until your hand hurts. Um, this gives you the chance to screw it onto the hose, spray your plants um, and then put it back in the shed to pull the bottle out again and you still have concentrate in the container because you'll need to be on a pretty uh, frequent and consistent spray schedule from July probably through September. You're going to spray about every seven to ten days to keep the petunia budworm or geranium budworm from eating all of your flowers. Um, the caterpillar comes from a tan or kind of light, creamy white colored moth that flies around and we see them in our gardens. Um, the moth lands on the plant, lays an egg, the egg hatches into a caterpillar and then the caterpillar goes about its business eating the flower buds. So as I mentioned, geraniums are one of their target plants, but petunias are the other target plant. <clears throat> and so here we have, let's set this down, have more room a beautiful hanging basket here we have a beautiful hanging basket with geraniums there's ver white verbena and we've got million bells little burgundy million bells and these beautiful pink petunias and more yellow million bells so this basket both the geraniums, the million bells, which are a type of petunia, and the petunia itself all could be vulnerable to the budworm. So we wanna keep an eye on it. And as we're doing our maintenance and our deadheading, we want to um, take note of anything that might tell us that it's time to start that spray. If you in the past have just had budworm and you're pretty sure 
that you're gonna get it again. It's not a bad idea to start spraying the BT or the Captain Jacks right around early July and then just go ahead and stay on top of it about every 10 days, uh, seven to 10 days. Just w look at the label and kind of um, go with whatever schedule works best for you. Petunias, <clears throat> again, this beautiful pink petunia are also another plant that benefits from being regularly deadheaded. So we showed this um, a couple of weeks ago, but again, if we were looking at, I'm just gonna take this big piece off. If we were looking at a petunia in close up, look at that pretty petunia. So looking at a petunia in close up, we can see all of the fresh flowers out and we have a flower bud that is developing and you'll get used to knowing the difference between a fresh flower and a not so fresh flower. So we wanna take the flowers that are done and remove them before they form a seed as well. So that's again called deadheading. And we do it not by just pulling the flower petals away, but by going back behind the flower itself and taking this little green part that see on the fresh flower the green part is sort of like what holds the flower so down here when I take that whole green part and pinch it off <clears throat> here's another example here we see the spent bloom kind of um, brown and papery looking go behind that and pinch it off like so. So this is a properly deadheaded, oops, I can't tell if I'm in. Uh, this is a properly deadheaded petunia bud. So they're sticky um, and uh, unfortunately it makes your fingers sticky when you do it, but um, hand sanitizer cleans them right off. So there you go, you can be sanitized after you finish deadheading your petunias. <clears throat> Million bells, which are these lovely uh, smaller versions of trailing petunia that come in so many pretty different colors. Million Bells are a newer, um, kind of newer introduction from breeders. And the coolest thing about Million Bells is that they have been bred to be self-cleaning. Um, so you don't have to deadhead them. Self-cleaning means that as this flower, we can see that it's kind of done. So as this flower fades before plant actually really forms a seed, the stem dries up and drops off by itself. So that happens on its own, whereas in the uh, old-fashioned flowers, we have to pull it off ourselves. So yay for self-cleaning plants, um, and breeders keep breeding more of those so that we don't have to do as much deadheading because petunias are sticky, and it's a lot of work to do it. Um, but try to be out on a weekly basis at least, and get your petunias deadheaded. That'll keep them blooming um, and looking best and um, flowering for as long as possible. It, so I was asked the other day and shown pictures, everybody now brings their phones in and takes pictures of things, which is so helpful. Um, but I was shown pictures of a sun-loving hydrangea that was recently planted and um, the customer that came in had read one of our newsletter articles about hydrangeas that are heat tolerant. And this happened to be, it was either one called uh, Strawberry Shake or another newer introduction of the panicle style hydrangeas called Little Hottie. So we had just written about Strawberry Shake and Little Hottie, about how they can take the heat. Little Hottie, as the name even implies, was bred in the southern part of the U.S. and is specifically bred to be heat tolerant. It's still a lot to expect that that brand new hydrangea that's purchased in maybe late June is going to be able to be heat tolerant and super perky uh, in mid-July when it was just planted a few weeks ago. So, it's important for us to recognize that in spite of the fact that we may choose plants that are heat and drought tolerant, um, it takes plants time to become adjusted to their environment. And so I wouldn't expect uh, the 
hardiness or durability of little hottie to develop and show really until the plant has an established root system and can show us what it can do. And that's gonna be after it's at least second year in the garden. So deep watering is the way to get plants established. <clears throat> my, my favorite uh, way to water is by using a water wand such as this. Water wands have these wonderful breakers so this is just like a really nice soft shower uh, nozzle that makes the water just not, you know, beat your plants down. Um, and we've got a sturdy, long <clears throat> one that helps us to kind of reach to the back of a bed or reach up to a hanging basket that's way over our head. And an on-off control on here as well. So we can slow the water's flow or turn it completely on or off. Um, without having to go back and, you know, turn the hose on or off itself. <clears throat> With a water wand um, and hand watering is, again, one of the best ways to be out in your garden on a regular basis, keeping an eye on things, watching for changes, pulling weeds and deadheading while you're watering your plants, for example. It is still uh, to give your newly planted trees and shrubs like a deep watering it's still not something that you're gonna like stand there probably and hold because we're talking about watering them with a, a slow trickle of water over a longer period of time, like 20, 30 minutes. So you're gonna pull the hose out, maybe you'll have the water wand on, but it's gonna be still just a trickle of water, like just falling from the hose, not shooting out a big shower. And then you can set your timer, um, put your phone timer on or go inside and put the oven timer on uh, and time that so that when you come back out, your water isn't pooling. That means you've got your water on too, too high, too much. You want the water to be going deep, straight down into the ground and deep. In addition to a water wand, you can use um, little timers. This is like the most basic timer. Um, it works like uh, on, um, in my kitchen, I have a little egg timer, you know, it just like turns and then it just tick, tick, ticks down till it turns off. The, that's exactly how this timer works. There's no batteries. Uh, there's no electrical plug-in needed. It screws right onto the hose bib itself. And then the hose is connected on this end. The timer can go to 120 minutes um, so 15 minutes is the shortest increment that it can time. Two hours is the longest increment that it can time. And the two hour, uh, you know, when the timer ends, it has a little valve that closes the water off from the tap. So the tap is still on, but it's no longer running out your hose. Um, so something like this can save you um, panic if you're forgetful or um, allow you to set 20 minutes of watering, for, exa for example, while you run off to the store for an hour or something like that. So again, gives you that benefit of an automatic turn off, uh, but it's not complicated like some of the more automated or digital timers that you know would turn on and turn off and need programming and batteries and all that kind of thing. So uh, very basic, very easy. And another oh, basic, easy uh, way to give deep watering to new plantings or even older plantings is a good old fashioned soaker hose. Um, so soaker hoses are like weeping hoses. So this hose is permeable, which means that as you plug it in, uh, screw it into your tap or to another hose and turn it on, the water is gonna come out of kind of the pores of the hose and water wherever the hose lays. That means you may need to coil it around individual plants so that you're watering the entire root ball and not just laying a little bit of water like on one side of a plant. Um, but they come in different lengths. So this is 25 feet that come in 75 feet or 50 foot lengths. And the um, longer your, ho your soaker hose goes, the further away it is from the water source, the less water is gonna come out. So just kind of pay attention to that. Don't run it too long 
um, or you'll see irregular water distribution along the line. Um, but soaker hoses are great for, again, um, that long watering of several plants at once to give you that deep soaking to help establish a root system that goes seeking out water by going down into the ground instead of becoming um, kind of uh, reliant on you to come back and water if you're a shallow, frequent waterer. Also, if you've got new plantings out there um, that you've just put in early this spring, or even if you've continued to plant later into the summer months, giving your new plantings not only a nice deep watering before a heat wave, but providing them with temporary shade um, makes a huge difference. A lot of us have figured out the benefit of uh, short-term frost protection in extreme cold weather. We know, and it's not uncommon to drive around town in wintertime and see, you know, little ghosts in people's yards. Plants that have been covered in sheets, covered in frost cloth um, to give them extra winter protection. But we now need to come to the same realization in the height of summer and be able to um, kind of run out in extreme temperatures and provide some temporary shade for new plantings, for vulnerable plants like hydrangeas. Uh, many of us can think about plants that really took hits from last year's heat dome and um, be more proactive this season if we see that kind of thing coming. So uh, we sell shade cloth by the foot, it's bulk, you can roll off uh, as much as you need, cut and kind of, you know, either lay over patio chairs, um, put up some posts and drape the shade cloth over a new planting um, just to relieve a little bit of the pressure of the heat and the sun, while of course they are new and just extra vulnerable. It is um, one of the most common questions that we are asked when it comes to talking about hydrangeas is how, how to prune them. And hydrangeas are definitely one of those plants that struggled in the heat last summer. And a lot of the flowers got burnt in uh, the first flush of flowers that it put out. So uh, if you were looking at kind of crispy brown looking flowers or part of the flower that didn't um, fare well in the heat, it, it's uh, like now is a great time to deadhead hydrangeas. We're in mid season and on the re-blooming hydrangeas, like all of the endless summer varieties, most of these new hybrids, new cultivars that are out on the market have remontenance or are re-bloomers. They flower on old wood as well as new wood, which allows them to bloom early in the season and then continue to bloom until late, late summer and even into fall. This is the original endless summer, um, which has already gone through a flush of blooms and now they've kind of faded from their pretty uh, pink or blue color to kind of the you know end of their life color. So we're going to remove these flower heads so that we can get another flush of blooms that'll be a little bit more colorful for this time of year. And by doing that, Get it up close to give you a little bit more uh, better view here. But I've already deadheaded the majority of this plant. I have already pruned and I've just left a few flowers so that we can cut the rest of them off. <clears throat> but when you, let's see, this is a good one to see. So when you look at a Hydrangea macrophylla, so the large leaf, smooth leaf hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla flower. We have the dome shaped flower on the top of the stem. Usually underneath the flower are a, is a small set of kind of wimpy, small looking leaves. So this first batch of leaves is sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't count them. So I go below that first set of leaves that's sitting right under the flower. Go past then See, oh, see how there's another set of leaves right here? So we're gonna pass the second set of leaves and cut either above the third 
or fourth set. And if we look here on the stem below, first set of leaves, second set of leaves, here's your third set. And at the third set, we can see some growth happening. So we see these two little bits of swollen bud growth. Those are flower buds that are gonna bloom in another six weeks or so. So we're gonna cut right above the swollen bits that we see at the leaf joints right there. So we cut, here's our head again. Here's the little kind of small leaves that we don't count. First set, second set, follow the stem and then cut above the third set. And that's where we had these little swollen nubs that are coming kind of right up above the leaf joint itself. So if we do that again. With this stem, which might be kind of easy again to see, flower bud. We have our small set of leaves. Get out of the way. Then the next set of leaves. So that's one, two, come on. And then right below that second set, we can see swollen buds. It's not very easy to show. I'm gonna cut that off. And here I'm gonna do one more, but show you what the swollen buds look like. So here is our flower. I'm gonna turn it around though, so you're gonna see the back of the flower. This one um, just ended up with a weird shape. So in the back of the flower, you see this small leaf, don't count it. So the, call that first set of leaves. Second set of leaves. And then I've cut above the third set. But in this case, you can see the swollen bit. So this is also a bud, which would be a flower bud or a growth node coming right above the leaves here. So if I were to cut on this one, where I cut is fine, but I could also cut this one right here. And now these little swollen bits on either side, those are gonna be our next buds that will grow up and produce a flower. If you go too deep, too far down, you'll remove the flower bud that's about to bloom. So don't cut too far down. If you cut too high, well, you'll still have a flower form, but you'll have like extra stem that's kind of, um, just junks up your plant. So you don't have to deadhead either. Uh, if you liked, if you like the kind of um, limey green or jewel tones that the faded flowers have, then there's no need to deadhead. It's going to continue to bloom anyways. Here at the garden center, we kind of you know want the plants to look their best and sometimes not everybody likes the look of this. Uh, so we're just pulling them off at this case. In this point in time, we know that the hydrangea is gonna bloom again and um, it won't take it long. So. Uh, for the sake of demonstration, as well as keeping it kind of clean and healthy looking, uh, we've gone through and deadheaded some ourselves. <clears throat> Believe it or not, out in your vegetable garden, in the edible garden, it is, um, well, so tomatoes are starting to make tomatoes, but we are finally about to start harvesting the first of our summer crops and our spring crops are really played out and ready to be removed. So um, peas, for example, your garden peas that you planted early spring, um, I'm sure you're harvesting the last of the pea pods if not already pulled them out. So time to pull out your peas. Um, all your radishes have probably been eaten. The lettuce that you put in early spring <coughs> is done. Kale, all those kinds of things. <coughs> Excuse me. But believe it or not, by mid to late July, and then on into early August, it's actually time to start planting your fall and winter vegetable garden. 
So if you look on your handout, you'll see um, this is now time to sow seeds for beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, um, celery you want to do from starts, radicchio and other um, you know, gourmet greens, absolutely, uh, plant those. And then overwintering cauliflower or broccoli, uh, those can go in as starts or seeds. And depending on the crop, you'll be either harvesting these plants in September or overwintering, September, October, or overwintering them and then harvesting them in like late March, early April. That would be your broccoli and cauliflower that you've overwintered. So um, grab a pack of seeds, put some carrots in this time of year. You're already you know, watering your garden anyways, so keeping carrot seeds uh, or other seeds hydrated until they germinate is not as difficult as you might think. And um, you'd be surprised at the ease of you know, having a, a fall harvest of some of these wonderful crops that we enjoyed in the early spring as well. So while you're, of course, uh, out weeding, watering, and tending the um, summer vegetables and harvesting soon, your summer vegetables, you can thin your seedlings and kind of monitor the crops that are developing that'll give you that fall and winter um, bounty as well. So if you've never tried to grow a fall garden or a fall and winter garden, um, do come in and chat with us. Right now we have a great seed selection of some of these edibles um, and soon we will start to bring in some fall and winter vegetables as well, but they're, they're just not out um, this early in the season. Now is time to think about seeds and making the space in your garden by removing plants that are spent or have been harvested. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really more like mid to late July and even on to early to mid August is when you're planting that fall and winter vegetable garden. It is um, in your garden as well. Now time to like monitor your veggies, tomatoes. Um, you may see developing uh, blossom end rot. So on your fruit, if the bottom end of the tomato fruit is kind of uh, discolored or leathery or sunken, um, you may have a um, you may have a deficiency in the soil or irregular watering could also cause the blossom end rot. Either improve your watering, be more consistent with watering. Uh, deep, regular intervals of watering is the best way to be consistent. Um, but it's also possible that you're lacking in calcium. Um, so we talk about planting with a uh, good supply of bone meal and lime in the hole, as well as using our tomato vegetable herb fertilizer, which has additional calcium. But you can apply a liquid calcium in a spray form to plants that are showing signs of calcium deficiency or blossom end rot. Um, and not only is that tomatoes, but peppers, um, beans, squash are uh, a few other plants that we see with problems with the blossom end rot developing. Um, Foley Cal here is just a, like a liquid calcium spray. You're going to spray it onto the buds, the blossoms, and as much of the foliage as possible. And the plant uh, kind of takes it in as a foliar spray to help correct in mid-season um, these kinds of problems that you may be seeing. So if, you've, if you're witnessing early signs of the blossom end rot on developing fruit, <clears throat> it can be corrected in mid-season so that your later harvests hopefully don't have the same problem. Um, so something that is wise to act on as soon as possible. Another thing that's good to act on as soon as possible um, and is starting to show up right at this time of year is um, mildew and specifically powdery mildew. So the kind of heat and still air of summer temperatures with um, kind of cool mornings and evenings that we're still having can set us up for uh, the perfect conditions for powdery mildew. And especially the wet, wet spring we had has really kind of laid the foundation to experience extra mildew problems this season. And we're seeing that uh, developing now on plants that are 
specifically prone to mildew in the first place. So um, mentioning your veggie garden, plants most prone to mildew in the vegetable garden are the um, squashes, zucchini, pumpkins, um, and cucumbers. So we see the great big leaf develop kind of a white powdery look over it, or sometimes we see it as patchy bits of white on the leaf. Before long that spreads to more of the foliage on the same plant and it, uh, it weakens the plant overall. <clears throat> this rose has uh, a bit of powdery mildew on the newest growth and it's just a, I'll show you the look of a healthy leaf, Oop, a healthy leaf against a mildewed leaf to see the color difference. So a healthy leaf is kind of deep green and shiny at this time of year and all one color, whereas a leaf with powdery mildew is a little bit uh, waffled in texture. So it's just a little bit warped when you look at it. It is also not shiny and it is not as deep of a green. It has kind of a gray appearance, and if you look closely, it, you would see sort of a overall white fuzzy appearance or a slightly dusty look to the foliage. Powdery mildew can be uh, treated with a fungicide, and the <clears throat> for roses, we actually, for ornamentals and roses, we typically use a systemic fungicide, so this is Infuse. Again, that great applicator bottle that just screws onto your hose and you don't have to mix anything up, but this sprays the, dilutes the concentrate out of the bottle, sprays your plants, you wanna spray till it's dripping off, uh, and then this is gonna give you about 30 days of protection. We are spraying our roses about monthly right now, and um, they're about due for a spray, so that, that uh, disease pressure that we see here might indicate that we should be spraying on more of a um, maybe three week basis instead of four. Uh, but these, uh, these mildew problems are connected to the, the weather um, and kind of our climate conditions. And so as the weather changes, we will also have less, less likelihood of mildew. Um, for an organic, and um, natural spray, if you are treating edibles, for example, like I mentioned, the pumpkins and the squash and cucumbers with powdery mildew, you would wanna use copper or an organic spray that's targeted for vegetables and edible plants. Um, so copper would be your fungicide on food crops, whereas the infuse being systemic is just a little bit more powerful for some of the um, ornamental plants that we have. It's um, also blueberry ripening time. So uh, if you have planted blueberries newly, um, maybe it's time to go out and take a look. It's always, uh, Duke is one of the earliest bearing varieties that we have um, to plant in our gardens. And so Duke is in full harvest right now and we are enjoying um, eating little bits of Duke blueberries here in the garden center. Anybody that has to go back and water in the berry section, um, you know, which there's lots of volunteers this time of year, uh, when you're watering, you get to enjoy any ripe berries that uh, are out there. So that's the rules. And um, if you do not have any blueberries in your garden and you um, think that it sounds wonderful to go out and pick blueberries while you're watering, we happen to be um, sitting on a nice selection of blueberries at most of our stores. So stop in and um, it's a great time to taste a few so that you can decide if you like their flavor before you plant them in the garden. So that's an advantage of putting out blueberries. Now, it's, um, what else have I got going on? Jasmine, Jasmine's in full bloom right now. The jasmine in my garden is in peak flower. It is where I sit down and just decompress at the end of the day. And it is such a, uh, it is such a potent aroma to me that it, it's almost like a, 
an instant um, response. When I smell it, I feel like I'm gonna, I feel inclined to relax. It makes me relax because it is the smell that kind of I relax around at the end of the evening on my patio. So it smells like home and it smells like barefoot, uh, chilling on the back deck with my shoes off and, uh, you know, uh, something cool to drink at the end of the day. Um, and that's pretty darn all right um, to me. So Jasmine, if you again don't have Jasmine in your garden, um, come and get some because you need it. And if you do have Jasmine in your garden, remember to keep it watered this time of year, especially if it's in a pot and a good regular fertilizing is going to help to extend its bloom period because now is its peak flower but it if it's uh not watered well or isn't fed or kind of growing in uh lean conditions it may just bloom for a month or six weeks and be done but with watering and care you can have your jasmine flowering through august easily so june uh middle of june through middle of july through at least middle of august um, which is a good three months of flowering Another fabulous bloomer in the vine section um, that's really giving us lots of color right now are clematis. And um, this is Jackman Superba, or just Jackman, which is one of the most common. Uh, it is Jackman Superba, probably one of the most common clematis, but uh, there are so many varieties. It is um, here in the Portland area, we are incredibly fortunate to have within, at least for us in Lake Oswego, we have within walking distance a like world famous botanical garden of nothing but clematis. It is a, it's the Rogerson Clematis Collection. It is a learning garden as well as a place where you can um, ask questions, learn more about clematis, see them in uh, lots of different environments and settings and even purchase there on site some um, really cool and unique varieties. What we carry here at the Garden Center, not all the unique and crazy cool varieties, but some of the most tried and true and common ones that will perform well for you in your garden. Today being Bastille Day, uh, for those of you international watchers or um, French folk, uh, Bastille Day is traditionally a Clematis pruning day. Um, so for your, uh, the, according to Linda Bueller, so she's the authority in the Northwest on clematis and uh, she goes out and prunes her spring blooming clematis on Bastille Day. So that is something that you could do this on this day. If you have a clematis that bloomed earlier in the season and is kind of done this time of year, a nice pruning on it now could actually get it to rebloom towards fall, uh, depending on the variety. So you could cut them back, give them a nice little feeding if they're due for it, um, and feel that you've done some, you know, done some future uh, benefit, or you will see a future benefit in your garden from what you do today. With that, um, don't forget to slug bait. The slugs are still out there. If there are questions that are specific and did not get answered in today's talk, please do ask them in the comment section. I'll be sure to reply. I hope that everyone has a wonderful uh, time out in their gardens. I'd love to see some photos of anything that anyone's growing. And um, as always, thanks for watching. Happy gardening.